This week on Dig Me Out. This is the type of band you don't want them going too far from their sound because it's going to get a little bit goofy. Tim and Jay review The Plastic Hassle by Wright. Hello and welcome to another episode of Dig Me Out. I'm your host, Tim Minichi, and joining me as always, my co-host, Mr. Jason Ziak. Jay, it's episode 184. Uh, we're in season four. We have a requested review. Requested, requested review. review. Ding, 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 ding. It's been a few. I already played the sound effect, Jay. You don't have to do oh. that. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I'll pipe down. <laughs> uh, it's been a few weeks since we've had a request to review. Uh, we're back with one. This one comes from Stuart Simons down in Australia. And he suggested a band also from Australia called Ripe. And as we were discussing prior to the start of the show, Ripe is a band name that is common. I mean, if you try to Google band ripe or ripe band, you're going to come up with about 10 different options. Not necessarily the one you're looking for in our case. Yeah. So this is why like a lot of new bands have ridiculous names, like long names, like ridiculous statements and such like cage the elephant and et cetera, et cetera, because you no longer can have a band name like Ripe. No. If you want to actually market your music. Yes. it's It just can't happen anymore. So we have Ripe. And like I mentioned, Stuart suggested, uh, suggested we check them out. He said, uh, greetings from longtime fan of the show and listener from Adelaide in Australia. Love you guys to review The Plastic Castle by Ripe. The opening track, Something Fierce, is on a list of Australia's 10 most underrated songs published by the website FasterLouder.com. He also uh, wanted to mention that the drummer Darren Seltman was a huge in- huge influence on Stuart when he was a drummer, and that he was a drummer in a band called Flat Stanley, who were also mentioned in the top 10 list of underrated Australian songs. So be sure to check that out. Faster, louder. It's the 10 most underrated Australian songs. He says he saw Wright play a few times around 92, and they tended to play in complete darkness with lo- with lots of long, indulgent feedback quests, which didn't really do it for mm-hmm. me. So this album's immediacy and killer riffs was much such a surprise, and remains one of my all-time favorites. And then he mentions that there are that the basically the American and the Australian versions of the album are are a little bit different, which we'll get into later. Jay, were you familiar with any of the various ripes out there, including this one? Despite there being so many, no, not at all. Uh, Neither was I. So let's talk some history of ripe. History of the band. And actually, this history was sort of cobbled together. Uh, there's not a good one single source. All music doesn't have a biography on them, so I kind of had to go to a couple different pages to find some information. So I know the band formed in the late 80s in Melbourne, Australia. Singer-guitarist Mark Murphy, uh, mentioned before Darren Seltman on drums, Katie Dixon on bass, and Peter Moran on guitar. They released their debut album, Filter Feed, in 1990 on Polyester Records, put out some singles, and then released their second album, which we're reviewing, the Plastic Hassle. This came out in 1993 in Australia, and I believe in 1994 in the UK and the US, and I was on Beggar's Banquet. Uh, the band ended up uh, a few years later uh, dissolving. Two of the members, Mark Murphy and Katie Dixon, went on to form a new band called Moon Driven, which is actually one of the titles of one of the songs on this particular record. Darren Seltman, he ended up joining a band, Avalanches, and Avalanches... Uh, he joined the band in, I believe, like 1996 or 97. He just left the band this year. Now, the band has only put out one record, and that came out in 2000. But they have remixed other artists, including the Manic Street Preachers. 
Uh, so they're primarily an electronic band, and he was a multi-instrumentalist in that band. In 2006, uh, Mark Murphy and Katie Dixon, along with some new members, reformed Ripe and released a new EP called Galaxies and Stars, but then disbanded again in 2007. That is your history of Ripe. If you would like to suggest an album for us to review like Stuart did, please visit the request review page at digmeoutpodcast.com. So we did get a little bit of Facebook feedback, some from Stuart. He says, I saw Ripe live quite a few times around 92 and 93. Seltman was mesmerizing on the skins with a loose, fluid style that totally anchored the rest of the band, who could get a little overpowering at times, with a lot of songs ending like Sonic Youth's Moat. I'm guessing that means the feedback and noise. This record was a revelation to me as it captures Ripe's glorious racket while bringing just enough control to allow the riffs and melodies to shine through. I love the loud band-in-a-room sound of this album. Very much of its time, and that's fine by me. The Australian release had another four tracks. Turmoil Fuel, the fantastic Love Your Gut single, which had a cover of Heroin and Across the Universe as B-sides. Moon Driven B-sides, Bone and bones and skin and something fierce beside instrumental the eggplant family it's a pity love your guts didn't make this short release but it makes sense that the album was tightened up to eight tracks there's a lot of affection for ripe and this album among among australia's aging indie rockers myself included and then gavin reed one of our other listeners from australia chimes in he says really looking forward to this review guys had this in the day lost it and have never been able to get it get it again I have a feeling I like it ma- like it more now than I did then. So Jay, you mentioned that this is a, a short record in terms of number of songs. It's only eight tracks, as opposed to the longer, I guess, twelve track uh, Australian version. Let's go. Let's go track by track. We only got eight tracks. That seems like a, a reasonable thing to do with only eight tracks. We can we can plow through these eight tracks here. Uh, let's start with the opening track, "Something Fierce." Thoughts on this? Uh, something promising. Mm-hmm. I, I like I like the song quite a bit. It's got a re- it introduces the sound of the band well. It's got a really cool tone t- to it. So there's like a, kind of a pick guitar, but it's got a little bit of dirt on it. Um, the bass is very important to this band. I think <clears throat> the points about the drums are well taken, and I think the drummer is important. But um, the bass does a lot of. Uh, melody and and uh, just the tone of it really fills the band out because the drum sound and the guitar sound can at times be a little bit brittle um so the bass does a really good job filling it out i think this is probably the most concise and well constructed song on the album too yes definitely uh, it, it, it really got my hopes up for what i was in for uh, gonna be in for it reminded me um at least at this point as uh, a little a little bit like Swerve Driver, but a yeah. l- more like compact and focused Swerve Driver. And, uh, you know, it, it does indulge a little bit in the outro with, uh, you know, there's uh, some drum fills there that are that are pretty cool when it gets a little bit noisy and louder, but it doesn't go off the rails like uh, some of the songs we're going to talk about here later. But right. overall, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. It really good, uh, surprising um, melodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times, I think even with like, Something like Swore Driver, the, at least vocally, sometimes that's not really there. It's not really the point, but um, there's moments here with this song being one where uh, the singer, I, I like the voice quite a bit, and he stumbles across some, some um, borderline hooks here, here and there.
you know, he mentioned, uh, Stuart mentioned that Sonic Youth thing. This this song sort of has the right combination for me of Sonic Youth and Swerve Driver. Um, it has that forward propulsion that Swerve Driver does so well. You know, we reviewed Mescal Head back in the first season. And it definitely, like, fits in line with that sort of sound of a lot of the tracks on that record. Um, I like his vocal, like you mentioned. It's it's This is a... Uh, in terms of production, the one song where it's the most distant sounding, uh, mm. the, the vocal, I think, sort of becomes a little clearer. It's not that it's muddy, but it's it sounds uh, like it's in a, a very distant room <laughs> with like uh, down a hallway somewhere that the guy's singing because it's it's very far back. Uh, when you get to the chorus, they beef it up a little bit. And I like his he's got a little bit of attitude when he sings uh, the chorus part. Which I liked, which I wasn't expecting. When when you get when you right. hear combinations of like st- Sonic Youth and Shoegaze and stuff like that, you don't often get attitude. Which this band, um, or at least uh, Mark Murphy, gives a little bit on that first track. Yeah, I like that. There's a confidence to the vocal, at least on this song. You know, it's um, it's 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 kind of breathy and relaxed, and uh, I think the effect, I think the the reverb and the delay, or whatever's on it, I think help quite a bit um i mean overall this this album is a wash and in reverb and delay Um, oh yeah and a lot of times it it works really well there's some times when it doesn't but this is definitely a case where it all um i think it it actually holds the band together sometimes um there's a lot of layering going on and i think that um that reverb and and delay actually kind of glue the glue the mix together including the vocal Let's move into track two, Supernatural, which uh, if you're talking about, you know, sort of the the swerve driver sound, um, this song, a bit more up-tempo, moves into that territory as well. It's guitar-driven, a bit more uh, energy on this track. And one thing that I like that they do, there's a sort of a a bouncing back and forth of a a counter melody and the the lead vocal and the pre-chorus. Uh, the two parts playing off of each other. Really, like, this is where the band, I think, starts to... I'm starting to get, like, an idea of what this band is and does. And I don't know. I think it holds up for most of the record. Some of the stuff on the... Uh, you mentioned it works and doesn't work. But I think by the second track, I'm I'm sort of pinning down, okay, I know what this band... You know, it's, this isn't going to be the, uh, the auteurs where you get that awesome lead track and then everything else goes to mid-tempo... Uh, boringness afterwards uh this is this is the one two punch of something fierce and supernatural kind of give you a, a good idea of at least sonically what this what this band is going to be about if not always tempo wise yeah it's uh this song reminded me a little bit of dinosaur junior um, mm-hmm. a couple of the other songs on the record did as well yeah um, musically using kind of big ragged chords but still very melodic you know either mixing in little riffs here and there or bass lines or, or things to to uh, carry a melody underneath those chords and this is a case where mix wise the, the band is more and less successful um this is one where particularly on the intro the drum sound and everything for some reason it sounds smaller to me it, it's weird like the first song sounds really big and full um this one i think not quite so much and I only bring that up because I think it's um there's a delicate balance here with the, the the tones this band is using they're using a lot of fuzzes and like I mentioned a lot of reverb and a lot of delay and um things can get really you know compressed and if you don't have all the right tones kind of coming together for that sometimes those sounds can go from sounding huge to all of a sudden sounding small um and I think it's important for this band to sound big you know, I, that's part of what works for me uh, with this band. But it's still a really good song. Um, I do like the it's sort of a dual vocal in the chorus that you mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of like another, it's it's, it's kind of like doubling, but uh, but delayed. And then every once in a while, there's a separate melody that comes out. Yeah, it's um, interesting, it's interesting use of a counter melody. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like unpredictable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it, um, which is which is nice. It, it fits what they're doing. Um, I'd say the song feels a little looser too. 
Um, it's not quite as tight as the first song. And in terms of progressing the record, I think uh, it's almost like they start tight and then the record gets looser and looser as it goes. So I think this is the second progression of that. Track three, Center of the Universe. Why don't you start off on this one? Tell me your thoughts. You know what's weird about this song is that um, it reminded me a lot of The Church. Hmm. When it starts off, um, it's, it starts off an acoustic. It's kind of a ballad sound. It's, it reminded me of, um, is it Under the Milky Way? Is that their song? Yeah. It, it just had that kind of vibe to it. But then the drums kick in and it goes in a totally different direction. Great ba- ba- bass tone on this song, again, that kind of holds it all together. They get to about four, it's six minutes long. This yeah. is where it starts, this record starts to get a little bit, um, I, it's, it puzzles me a little bit and... Um, so, you know, you're four minutes into the song, they kind of go to a double time part, which doesn't really work for me because the song is kind of a nice mid tempo y blush kind of proto ballad or something. And then they just play a double time. And then for the next two minutes, it ends up becoming kind of a noise jam. I, you know, wait, my interest wanes. Um, so it kind of is a. It, it's, it's a nice, you know, having a song that has, you know, an acoustic mixed in and has a little slower tempo is nice for track three, but it starts to reveal the other side of this band towards the end of the song that I'm not as excited about. Yeah, that ending minute and a half is a little problematic. I wish it had just been shorter. I don't mind, you know, going off on a little bit of a tangent at the end of the song, mm-hmm. especially this being a slower song. It just went on a little bit too long. Um, probably could have been 30 seconds and I would have been happy. The song didn't need to be 613. It could have been, you know, f- five something and would have made sense. Uh, but I liked the sort of drugged out shoegazy kind of feel of the yeah. song. You know, I, I think that after I heard those first two tracks and I was hearing those guitars, I figured a song like this was coming. So mm-hmm. it, it made sense. And I, I like... I don't know if they're doing the what they're doing in terms of the production wise, whether it's like an acoustic and then a, a doubled by an electric, or if they're doing that thing where the, they're miking an electric, like I, I think uh, there's on the three outside. Separate, I think there's three separate guitar tracks. Okay. It starts off with like a a dirty strummy guitar, then like um, a, a chunkier kind of electric guitar is there, and then an acoustic appears. And I think all three of those stay with within a lot of the, uh, the you know, the, the beginning part of the song, the verses. So, and they're paying, they're kind of playing different, slightly different parts. That's why I don't think it's using that technique because I think the parts are different enough that, unless they're offset or something, but it, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because they're all, all three are kind of strummy, but they're all playing different things. That's why I was saying, I, I think the, uh, you know, the bass holds this together quite a bit. So track 4J, uh, Moon Driven, which is, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the show, the name of the band that uh, two of the members would form after this band uh, went on hiatus. Um, this is uh, this is where I think one of the biggest 
issues with this album came up for me, which is uh, the sometime extended parts uh, that they throw into the songs. Um, for example, on this song, it takes about a minute 50 to get to the vocals. And I feel like that's about a minute 50 too long, um, or at least a minute 30 too long. There's like a, a quiet, loud part, sort of a slow, up-tempo push and pull that goes on in the first half of the song, or the, or the first minute 50, which would have been fine if they did it like once or twice as an intro for the song. But like I mentioned, they do it for a minute and 50 seconds, and then they come into the vocal, which I actually like the vocal, and I like the lyrics for this song. Um, the opening line is, uh, I struggle with my, or I am privileged by my race, which is an interesting line to open the song with. And he has some other interesting mm -hmm. um, lines in mm -hmm. the song. I struggle with my beliefs. They keep turning around on me. I liked uh, quite a bit of the, the lyrics, not just on this song, but on, on the record as a whole. So um, I'm curious as to your thoughts on um, Moon Driven and, and some of the issues that I had with it. I agree. The intro is wholly unnecessary. It, it doesn't even make sense until you hear the vocal. And once they fit the vocal and then you understand, like, the parts, why they <clears throat> are the way they are. Um, mm -hmm. There is a push and pull. There's a, a abrupt, a, an abruptness to the different parts that are used in the intro that sound a little amateurish until you hear it. You know, there's a vocal exchange and then the more I guess, intense part or heavier part or however you want to describe it uh, happens. And, and it's a back and forth between that and the vocal, which totally works. I mean, you're, you could trim off a minute 30 or almost two minutes of that intro and he wouldn't really be detrimental to the song in any way. And that, that also happens on, on track five, The Plastic Hassle. Um, you've got this sort of like built to spillish sort of tone, guitar tone and, and parts going on. You know, a lot of leads, a lot of intricate parts. Uh, and then the the vocal doesn't start until about four minutes into the seven minute long song. I, I think it's a cool song and I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with it, but I almost feel like you could have split this into two songs. Uh, you know, there's, there's cool parts going on, but I don't necessarily feel like again, that that intro would need to be as long to this song as it is. Yeah. So at three thirty, it, it, uh, this riff emerges that is, is kind of a concise version of the entire intro of the song. So they took the themes um, that are present through the melodies of the intro and turned it into a uh, pretty pretty solid, concise riff. Um, and then from there on out, it's a pretty decent song. Um, again, I think like the last song, I'm not quite sure why we need that super long intro. It's not really doing anything that isn't done on the second half of the song in either a more interesting or more effective way. But um, <clears throat> something funny about this song is that the, the very beginning opening kind of picking sequence maybe for the first 20 seconds or so sounds like uh, early Metallica, like an early Metallica ballad. Oh, really? Um, yeah. <laughs> just I don't know, the, court, the, the, you know, the pattern that he's picking out there, it, it just kind of reminded me of that. It's kind of got like a do dark, somber, like ominous a little bit ominous uh, sense to it. And then uh, it obviously goes in different directions from there. But when I first kicked in, I was like, oh, kind of just uh, reminded me of that. Well, on track six, it reminded me of a, of a couple artists, Jay. Um, it's uh, got this kind of lazy country feel to it, which um, if you took sort of some Jay Massis guitar from Dinosaur Jr. and combine that with, this is going to be a weird comparison, but some some latter day Jesus and Mary chain when they when they decided to go folky uh, electric acoustic on their uh, stoned and dethroned album um, it has that kind of feel. It's it's actually one of my favorite songs on the record. Uh, Get your shit together. Which side note, our band Stafford Five had a song called Get Yourself Together. I kind of wish we had changed the song title and lyrics to get your shit together because I think that would have been way cooler. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really, uh, I really dig this track. What about you? Yeah, if our song sounded like this, it would have been a lot cooler too. Um, I agree. This is one of my favorite songs on the on the record. 
it's a different sound than the rest of the record in terms of there's a lot more separation between the guitars and the the drums. So the guitars are a very um, high pitched kind of a, kind of a tone. Very, it's they're very actually the the sound of it and the chords are playing are actually very pretty. The um, the drums are big and booming, like um, mm-hmm. and they're big roomy sound. So there's all this separation <clears throat> that occurs. That's really nice. Um, a lot of the rest of the record things are. Um, a lot closer together and almost at times a little bit muddy. Um, and this one's different. Tons of reverb on it. It has a almost once it kicks in and everything goes, starts starts moving and almost kind of gets to a you know swirling guitar feel. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know I don't know. Would you call this a ballad? Sort of it's is kind of a noisy noisy yeah. ballad. It has a it has a ballad um, feel to it. Definitely not a power ballad, but you know, it's not one of dead or alive or anything like that, but it's definitely a, a ballad. I don't know. At the end there, when they kick in the, <laughs> at the end there, where they kick in the fuzz and they do the guitar lead, it, it starts to sound a little power ballady. Well, you never know. Because it never picks up. It never like right. shifts to a different tempo. I mean, it's always in the slow, slightly plodding uh, kind of tempo. But yeah, I think this is a sound that I like on this band quite a bit. Um, and it's a good change of pace. Um, this is the type of band you don't want them going too far from their sound because it's going to get a little bit goofy. Um, but this is just enough to keep some keep the the end of the record interesting. So track seven sort of returns to uh, the earlier part of the record. That's uh, the song's called Mother Figure, and it's it's more up tempo, and it has more of the of the drive of uh, tracks two track two Supernatural and the and the opening track Something Fierce. Um, I, I liked this song not as much as the first two tracks at the beginning of the record, uh, but I, I like the fact that you know the whole second half of the record isn't all you know six and seven minute long weird long intro songs like they throw in this rather short song uh to break it up i think it's it's a fine track the riff's kind of cool but it doesn't have the same uh vocal impact for me in terms of the melody for the chorus as as the first track does uh what'd you think of track seven mother figure uh i liked it a lot it it probably reminded me the most of a dinosaur junior song i think you know vocally if you put jay mass's vocal on this i would completely buy it mm-hmm. as a dinosaur junior song um i like the tempo it's a nice shift from the slower song before it um i like the opening riff it gets a little noisy uh and experimental but they snap out of it pretty quick to an outro that that works pretty well one of the things that's funny about it i think it's the only song on that record that fades out or some of the others you know you get into longer jams at the end um, this one they did, but they made the decision to, to, to fade it out and cut it short, which was actually kind of nice. It just it, it gives you the feeling of you get the sense of like where the jam went and what's going on without actually having to listen to another one. <laughs> so it's consistent with the rest of the record in some strange way without um, 
belaboring the point, I guess. Speaking of belaboring the point, we go from the shortest song on the record to easily the longest song. And that's the final track, uh, number eight, Daylight Wants to Kill You, which I think is a <laughs> a cool title. And it should be um, it should be the title of perhaps a, a new Steven Seagal movie or a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie about a <laughs> about a a guy who uh, is a scientist and he has to fight against uh, the sun which is tearing a hole in our ozone uh, through uh, sunbursts and he has to uh, figure out a way to replenish the uh, ozone wouldn't it be about vampires <laughs> perhaps Daylight wants to kill or you? it's from the yeah it's from the perspective of a sensitive vampire who just wants to get along and he really wants to see this girl and she uh, only is around during the you know very late at night and very early in the morning so he can't hang out with her <laughs> okay so that's a tangent she's only around yeah she's only she works second shift Jay so she's not around to talk to him <laughs> you know she works in a, she works as she works in an anti vampire factory or, or facility, and he's trying to win her over. And uh, so let's talk about daylight wants to kill the song, not the perspective screenplay that I'm working on. Uh, for a ten minute and fifty one second long song, this is actually this didn't feel like it was ten minutes and fifty one seconds. It's actually an interesting song. Um, it's sort of this mid tempo y dark riff uh which is a bit different for the band but um it's it's a cool song obviously it's repetitive at 10 minutes and 51 seconds but it didn't bore me and it, i didn't find myself necessarily fading out but i did you know the song would be on and then i would look and it'd be over and I'd be like oh 10 minutes just went by which is actually kind of scary when you think about it that you just blank out for 10 minutes and i've lost 10 minutes of my life but anyway let's not get into that uh, I think I thought it was a cool track. I think it's a good closer for the band. And since this is only an eight-song album, I don't mind that it's such a long track. What about you? Um, I'm a little conflicted on this song. I like the the dark driving riff. Um, kind of reminds me of something that would be on a typo negative or Danzig album. The sure boom 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 yeah boom, 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 okay boom. I can you see know, that it's like super dark and. But it's not, I struggle with it coming from this band. It's just so out of left field. Um, mm -hmm. They do resolve it in that they shift up um, and go to some lighter sounding chords. Um, and, and over, the, you know, the song has enough variety that it's not just about that riff, but it is a big part of the song. So while I like the sound of it, and it, it's just so odd coming from this band in a way, um, certainly fits the title. Um, yeah there's no doubt about that it's not a bad 10 minutes you know I, I think we've you know for the most part pan most albums that have or most songs that are you know in the 10 minute range in the 90s yes um i think they make pretty good use of most of that time um alternating between you know they go to a double time part that i think is a reprise of basically this riff and they shift up you know the light and dark thing enough with with chord changes that um uh, it, it works mostly. Um, it does get a little bit monotonous towards the end, but you know it's fairly successful for for a song that long, which is very difficult to do. It is. So let's talk about our overall rating on this record. Eight songs, short record, lot to digest though. These are some long songs. So, Jay, were the album better EP, decent single? Where are you at? I'm at a worthy album. I don't, you know, it's only eight songs. Um, I don't know that there's any, you know, songs that I would completely remove off of this record. I think, um, I think we can quibble over some of the editing and, and um, overall production choices. I think it could have been with a producer could have been a lot more uh, successful um, with a stronger producer, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, if you like the bands that we've mentioned through this, you know, it's definitely worth a listen, and you know, I think some folks might might really enjoy it a lot. Um, 
So I think it's a worthy album, if nothing else, because it's only eight songs. Right. <laughs> and I, I agree with you on all those points. I think that this is a worthy album because of the fact that there are no weak songs and it's such a short record that even the songs that do have issues, there, there's still enough good in them that I sort of, when I'm ranking these songs, I, I color code them. Green is like, I absolutely, you know, dig this song. Yellow is like, eh, this is a good song, but, you know, I changed something about it. And red is like, I terrib- I hate this song. Um, there's no red for this band. It's all half green, half right. yellow. Four green, four yellow. So to me, that's a worthy record. Right. And yeah, there's just, there's just some editing choices. I think, you know, if they had had, you know, a, a stronger or, or a more active producer in the studio with them, Maybe he would have said, hey, guys, uh, let's maybe chop the first minute and a half off this song. Or maybe let's make it its own track and make it a little instrumental before you go into the next one. And that way people can use their CD skipper button and skip forward. Or perhaps in the future they won't have to use that because there will be some sort of a computer device that will (laughs) allow them to just delete that track from their playlist. But uh, he didn't have that kind of foresight. So right. we have this record, and it's a good record, and I think the people should check it out. Um, and I think we should thank Stuart Simons for suggesting this record because this was um, this is a cool one, and I think that there's a good chance that one of these songs, perhaps the first track, "Something Fierce," might end up on a uh, year-end selection from one of us. Maybe me. Who knows? Got to, still got a, almost almost half the year left, so something could uh, really you know knock it out of the ballpark, but. Um, yeah, very cool record. Thank you, Stuart, for suggesting this. And uh, if you want to suggest an album for us to review, head on over to digmeoutpodcast.com and hit our request review page. That's where you make suggestions. And of course, if you like what you heard, please consider leaving us some positive feedback over at iTunes. Jay, it's time to wrap it up. Got to put the bow on this one and say goodbye. But we're going to be back. Uh, with another request to review next week, Jay, and another Australian band. How about that? Man, we do a lot of Australian bands. Yeah, we should just call this uh, Dig Me Out Down Under. Dig Me Out Australia? Yeah, Dig Me Out Australia. Or we should franchise this yeah, out. Uh, Gavin, Stewart, and some of our other Australian listeners, if you'd like to start Dig Me Out Australia, we would like to propose that now. You guys can... Start our first franchise. Did you hear that? <laughs> did you hear that Gene and, and um, Paul might be leaving Kiss and being replaced? Jay, did you read yeah, that article? Yeah, they've been planning that. Yeah, they've been planning that for a long time. So here you go. We're gonna find our replacements, our coin advance, if you will. <laughs> All right, we're out of here. We'll be back next week with another episode. Dig me out. Join the conversation about this episode at digmeoutpodcast.com, where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as links to our request a review and merchandise pages. 